it's my real pleasure uh, to welcome you all here now. Um, uh, this panel is, is, is going to uh, talk about and, uh, and think through with Claudia Rankine um, her book, Citizen and American Lyric. Uh, this is a book that um, I'm sure many of you have, have encountered and read. I know at Bard, it was a required book reading for all incoming freshmen. Um, and uh, I know that at least in about 13 of our classes this semester, it's being taught uh, in all or part. So um, it's a book that has uh, had an enormous impact uh, in the country uh, and also um, here at Bard. And uh, it is uh, a real honor and pleasure for me personally um, to, to have the opportunity to welcome Claudia Rankine here. Claudia Rankine um, is the author of five collections of poetry, including Citizen. Also, uh, her book, Don't Let Me Be Lonely, um, which in some way is going to be adapted with, by her and Homie Baba uh, for a new performance and part of a ser series on surveillance at Bard College through the Fisher Center um, coming up in the next uh, little while. So I hope you all look out for that. Um, she's also written two plays, including Providence of Beauty, a South Bronx travelogue, and has done many video um, collaborations. I mean, one of the things that's beautiful and wonderful about her books and work is the way she brings in art um, and, and video uh, into her, her work and her writing. Um, she's now currently the Frederick Eisenman Professor of Poetry at Yale University, and she's the recipient of the Poets and Writers Jackson Poetry Prize and fellowships from the Lannan Foundation and the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, I'll, I'll say more about uh, my experience of reading Citizen later, uh, but let me say that I've read it a number of times now, and there's no book I've read in recent memory that has given me more pleasure, anger, frustration, and sense of meaningful engagement than Citizen. Um, it's a book that's super difficult in many levels, and, but it's a book of thinking. And uh, to me, it's a perfect uh, book for us to be talking about, and Claudia is a per person for us to be um, hearing from as we think about how to have real talk about these very difficult questions of race, sex, and religion. Um, I'm very happy also that we have three uh, super uh, um, uh, people, all uh, people I, I care about their work greatly, here to um, give short discussions about Claudia's work and her presentation. Um, Bob Boyers, uh, Robert Boyers, uh, is the editor of Salma Gundi magazine, which is one of the really last bastions of independent thought magazines left in the country. And um, he's also the director of the New York State Summer Writers Institute, and he's a professor of English at Skidmore College. Um, Ariana Stokas uh, is a Bard grad, um, and uh, recently completed her PhD at Columbia University. And she's now here at Bard, a dean, a dean um, for inclusive excellence. Um, and uh, I'm thrilled to have Ariana uh, uh, with us. And then Carolyn Lazard, who's also a Bard grad. Um, she's uh, uh, an artist and performer. She's a founding member of the uh, Canaries Art Collective. And she, in 2015, won the Win New, the Win New House Award. So this is a very uh, distinguished and exciting group of speakers. Um, Claudia is going to begin by speaking and showing um, a video. And then uh, we'll have the comments. And then we'll have time for a, I hope, spirited and thoughtful discussion. Thank you very much. Please welcome Claudia Rankine. I'm, I, what time is it? Good morning. <laughs> it's 1116. Um, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And, um, it's an honor to be here inside this conference. I, uh, I was going to start differently, but I, I think it's good to give a bridge from the thing that just happened to 
where we are now. Um, so I thought I would start with a poem that is not in Citizen and not in, on my person, but is in my device. So, <laughs> so I'm going to start by reading that. Um, I, Gorin, if I may, can I call you Gorin? I don't know you, but, um, but everyone else was calling you Gorin. So I, <laughs> um, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, the, the example you gave of the, um, I guess the engineer or, or someone from the Ivory Coast being asked to perform his ethnicity, um, I, that moment is actually a racist moment. That moment of um, the white imagination um, calling for perf exotic performances of one sense of place, you know, the originating place, is for me a moment when otherness is being insisted upon. And that to me is not the same thing as diversity. That's not the same gesture in terms of the opening out of space to, to be a collective place. That, that moment when, when one is saying, oh, won't you cook that ethnic food of yours, is, is a moment when the ownership of the new place is being insisted upon as not your place. And so I just wanted, because I, I felt like it was being offered up as um, the ills of diversity, that kind of language. But in, in my experience, that is the language of, uh, of racism. So I wanted to start with this. See, this is, you don't get to respond. <laughs> um, I want to start with this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, we can do it. Yes, yes. Um, but the other, the other part of the, the, uh, the um, discussion, the very interesting discussion, had to do with the parts of white America that don't fit into the narrative of white greatness and the people that have gotten um, left behind, partly because they have signed on for the, for whiteness as a category that does not get interfered with by class. Um, so I don't, you know, so there's a sense that there's a kind of um, um, willful um, erasure of poor whites, when in fact, I think that is true, but I also think that poor whites have consistently voted against their interests and refused alliance with um, people of color because of an aspirational positioning up against white, whiteness as the dominating space in American culture. So both things are happening at the same time. If you remember when Martin Luther King was killed, he was killed when he was trying to bring together everybody under the same umbrella um, economically. Um, anyway, so I, I, I was thinking about Bob Dylan getting getting um, that wonderful award and recognition. And it made me, that song he has, The Pawn in the Game, I was thinking about that as you were speaking, and then I remembered that I had written this. Sound and Fury. Dispossessed, despair, depression, despondent, dejection. The doom is the off-white of white. But wait, white can't know what white feels. Where's the life in that? Where's the right in that? Where's the white in that? At the bone of bone white breeds the fear of seeing, the frustration of being unequal to white. White male portraits on white walls were intended to mean ownership of all, the privilege of all, even as white walls white in. And this is understandable, yes. Understandable because the culture claims white owns everything. 
the wealth of no one anyone knows. Still, the equation holds. Jobs and health and schools and better than before and different from now and enough and always and eventually mine. This is what it means to wear a color and believe the embrace of its touch. What white long expected was to work its way into an upwardly mobile fit. In the old days, white included a life even without luck or chance of birth. The scaffolding held, had rungs and legacy and the myth of meritocracy fixed in white. Now white can't hold itself distant from the day's touch. Even as the touch holds so little, white would own. Foreclosure, vanished pensions, school systems in disrepair, free trade rising, unemployment, unpaid medical bills, school debt, car debt, debt debt. White is living its brick and mortar loss, staving off more loss, exhaustion, aggrieved exposure, a pale heart even as in daylight, white hardens its features. Eyes which hold all the light harden. Jaws which close down on nothing harden. Hands which assembled and packaged and built harden into a fury that cannot tell power to account. Though it's not untrue, jobs were outsourced. And it's not untrue, an economic base was cut out from under it's not untrue. If people could just come clean about their pain, the being at a loss when just being white is not working. Who said there is no hierarchy inside white walls? Who implied white owns everything even as it owns nothing? But white can't strike its own structure. White can't out its own system. All the loss is nothing next to any other who can be thrown out. In daylight, this right to righteous rage doubles down the supremacy of white in our way. So I, was, I just was reminded of that because of the doubling, the punching up and the doubling down. I'm going to read um, because um, I'm very honored that Citizen has been read by many of you and so I thought I would put my voice into your ears from that book. And then I'll show a, um, a video, and then I'll sit down. Um, is that? Oh, space bar. Yeah. Uh-oh, that's a film. Oh, yeah, I think I'll, I'll do the PowerPoint. So I, I, I always feel like if I give a reading, I have to mention um, the artists who gave me permission to use their work in this book. And on the cover is the hoodie by um, Hammonds, David Hammonds. Um, it was done in 1993. Many people believe that he did it after the killing of Trayvon Martin. But it was actually done not necessarily in direct response to, but right after the beating of Rodney King. Um, and Hammonds is uh, someone who's influenced by Duchamp and likes to say that he is um, um, a member of a 
Deschamps outpatient clinic. Um, and he did things like uh, selling snowballs on the side of the road. And I, I always, whenever I see that image, I always think that he's trying to allow you to have whiteness melt in your hands. Um, and another uh, sort of canonical piece of his is the basketball hoop, the bejeweled basketball hoop, which when it was originally um, shown, was shown with the hoop very close to the ceiling to um, create a metaphor around aspirational living for inner city black youth. This is um, Hammond's in a piece called Consider in Black and Blue, which is an extracted poem inside of Citizen, um, which is why it's there. When you're alone and too tired even to turn on any of your devices, you let yourself linger in a past stacked among your pillows. Usually you are nestled under blankets and the house is empty. Sometimes the moon is missing. And beyond the windows, the low gray ceiling seems approachable. Its dark light dims in degrees depending on the density of clouds and you fall back into that which gets reconstructed as metaphor. The root is often associative. You smell good. You're 12 attending St. Philip and James School on White Plains Road, and the girl sitting in the seat behind asks you to lean to the right during exams so she can copy what you have written. Sister Evelyn is in the habit of taping the hundreds and the failing grades to the coat closet doors. The girl is Catholic with waist-length brown hair. You can't remember her name, Mary, Catherine. You never really speak except for the time she makes her request and later when she tells you, you smell good and have features more like a white person. You assume she thinks she is thanking you for letting her cheat and feels better cheating from an almost white person. Sister Evelyn never figures out your arrangement, perhaps because you never turn around to copy Mary Catherine's answers. Sister Evelyn must think these two girls think a lot alike, or she cares less about cheating and more about humiliation, or she never actually saw you sitting there. That piece is followed by this image. It was done by um, David Michael Murphy. And when I first saw it, I thought it was Photoshopped. It's um, Jim Crow Road in Flowery Branch, Georgia. And I asked him, um, did he ask the residents why the street is called Jim Crow Road? And he said he did, and they said that it was named after James Crow. And... <laughs> Why not, right? And, um, and so I said, did you ask them why they didn't just call it James Crow? And he said he did, and they said, um, well, we call him Jim. And so, but apparently there are many Jim Crow roads around the country. I wanted to start with this image because for me, it was a metaphor of how we live in the United States. Um, the White Houses. On, and the lawns and the protective lawns. That, that sense that um, Jim Crow segregation um, has determined our relational positioning up against the other. That um, we live in homes where people who um, don't look like us, um, to use um, Tennessee Coates's phraseology, um, don't belong in our homes, don't, um, you know, get asked to enact their ethnicity for our amusement or our pleasure. Um, so it seemed that segregation forever, the rallying cry for the KKK managed to infiltrate itself inside the culture of the American imagination and has kept the races separate 
in ways that are um, both um, domestic and institutional, structural, legislative. Uh, I, I was, I, I don't know, how many people have watched the um, 13, the 13th men, um, where the white politicians are now um, admitting that the whole drug policy, the whole war on drugs, was meant to reinstate Jim Crowism by getting, by targeting blacks and using criminalization as a way of pulling them out of the culture that that was the original plan and that's how it managed to work itself out. So 25% of the world's incarcerated people are incarcerated in the United States. 25%. And let's not ask what percent of that is African American because then we would all have to cry. Um, since I'm in an uh, academic environment, I'll read this. You're in the dark, in the car, watching the black tarred street being swallowed by speed. He tells you his dean is making him hire a person of color when there are so many great writers out there. You think maybe this is an experiment and you are being tested or retroactively insulted or you have done something that communicates this is an okay conversation to be having. Why do you feel comfortable saying this to me? You wish the light would turn red or a police siren would go off so you could slam on the brakes, slam into the car ahead of you, fly forward so quickly both your faces would suddenly be exposed to the wind. As usual, you drive straight through the moment with the expected backing off of what was previously said. It is not only that confrontation is headache producing, it is also that you have a destination that doesn't include acting like this moment isn't inhabitable, hasn't happened before, and the before isn't part of the now as the night darkens and the time shortens between where we are and where we are going. I'm going to read two more pieces and then we'll move on to the film. This is everything I'm skipping. My brothers are notorious. They have not been to prison. They have been imprisoned. The prison is not a place you enter. It is no place. My brothers are notorious. They do regular things like wait. On my birthday, they say my name. They will never forget that we are named. What is that memory? The days of our childhood together were steep steps into a collapsing mind. It looked like we rescued ourselves, were rescued. Then there are these days, each day of our adult lives. They will never forget our way through these brothers, each brother, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. Your hearts are broken. This is not a secret, though there are secrets, and as yet I do not understand how my own sorrow has turned into my brother's hearts. The hearts of my brothers are broken. If I knew another way to be, I would call up a brother, I would hear myself saying, my brother, dear brother, my dearest brothers, dear heart. On the tip of a tongue, one note following another is another path, another dawn where the pink sky is a bloodshot of struck, of sleepless, of sorry, of senseless, shush. Those years often before me and my brothers, the years of passage, plantation, migration, of Jim Crow, segregation, of poverty, inner cities, profiling of one in three, two jobs, boy, hey boy, each a felony. 
accumulate into the hours inside our lives where we are all caught hanging. The rope inside us, the tree inside us, its roots our limbs, the throat slice through, and when we open our mouth to speak, blossoms, oh blossoms, no place coming out. Brother, dear brother, that kind of blue. The sky is a silence of brothers all the days leading up to my call. If I called, I'd say goodbye before I broke the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. My brother hangs up, though he's there. I keep talking. The talk keeps him there. The sky is blue, kind of blue. The day is hot. Is it cold? Are you cold? It does get cool. Is it cool? Are you cool? My brother is completed by sky. The sky is a silence. Eventually, he says, it is raining, it is raining down. It was raining, it stopped raining, it is raining down. He won't hang up. He's there, he's there, but he's hung up, though he's there. Goodbye, I say. I break the goodbye. I say goodbye before anyone can hang up. Don't hang up. Wait with me. Wait with me, though the waiting might be the call of goodbyes. That piece is followed by this image. Um, the original image, which used to live next to it, has disappeared, but that's okay. Um, this image is a doctored image. The, um, the original image has two men hanging from that tree. Uh, but I don't really, I wasn't really interested in, in the lynched parties in, in the immediate sense, obviously I'm interested in them. Um, I was interested in those people. Um, the, when, I, when I wrote to Getty to get the rights to this image, they told me I couldn't have it. And the original image with the lynched men hanging from the tree. And, um, you know, and I do a lot of documentary work, and so you don't listen. <laughs> you, you sort of say, um, okay, and you hang up. Because there's no point in having a fight with somebody who's not going to do what you would like. And so, um, so you called back the next day and you hope you get somebody else. And I called back the next day and they said to me, no again. And then I, I, I did listen to that no. You know, if somebody tells you something twice, you listen. And so the second time I, I, I realized they're not going to let me buy the rights to the Senate. So I said, why not? Why can't I have it? And they said to me, we won't sell it to you because um, we are uh, into um, mediary between the Hulton Archives and you. And the Hulton Archives feels, they fear, they fear that the people who want to buy the rights to this image want it in order to use it to support what is in the image. And so they're, they're saying this to me and the words are landing one at a time. The people who want to buy the rights to this image want to use it to support what is in this image. And then it, I was like, wait, wait, I am not a white supremacist. This is not me. So I, I said, I said, you know, um, I don't think I'm those people. So will you allow me to send you the text and um, find out directly from them if they would allow me to buy the rights? And so they said yes after a few weeks. And they sent me, the Im they, well, they sent me an email saying you can now purchase the image, the use of the image. And so I, um, I purchased the use of the image and then I called them back and I said, uh, is it okay if I Photoshop the men out of the image? From, they were lynched in Marion, Indiana. And they said, oh, of course, you can do that. Because for them, that's the site of the problem, right? That's the scandal. That's the problem, the lynched bodies of black people. When the real problem are the white people who sent this around as a postcard saying, look what I did on Saturday. And that tolerance for black bodies in the United States as part of what it means to be a citizen of the United States 
has moved through generations, through those bodies, into your bodies. And so we are still sitting around, and it's okay for police to kill unarmed black people and for us to hang out at our conferences. So that has managed, that tolerance has managed to move forward through the years and stay inside of the bodies of the descendants of those people. All right, I'm going to end the reading portion of the evening, the morning, um, with this. I'm really, you know, I, I, I'm teaching a class this semester on constructions of whiteness. And I got an email this morning from a student. And he said, you know, I need to come to your office hours because we need to really talk about where on the syllabus is um, ethical whiteness. We've been talking about a lot of things, but I don't know where ethical whiteness resides in the syllabus. We, um, we, we began by talking about um, 1790 Immigration Act. The first time the phrase white was used, it was used in order for white Anglo-Saxons to hold on to the power. So it was in the Immigration Act, and it was being used against other ethnic white people. So it was a voting act that, for self-governance, and it said um, that free white men could vote. But they, they meant white Anglo-Saxon men who had come um, there first. And it did not include Italians did not include the Irish, did not include many others. So it was at, at the moment when the line had to be drawn. Because you know, back then, blacks weren't people, they were property, and American Indians had been eradicated from the land. So you know, genocide and slavery was already accepted, so we weren't even in the discussion around how to keep whiteness safe. It was really against immigrants coming in. I mean, the second iteration of the KKK actually was against Catholics. Um, hence the burning cross, right? Anyway, I was, so I was thinking about this student saying, where are the ethical white people on your syllabus? And um, that's a good question. Um, Abolitionists, maybe? Um, so I was thinking I would read this because there are all these little ways that in the daytime, in the course of a day, we try as individuals to accommodate the problems of our democracy. And I'm always interested in what those are. And... Um, like spinning what Donald Trump says is a, is a manifestation of that, right? I grabbed her pussy. He didn't, he didn't mean that. He was, it was locker room talk, because that's how people talk in locker rooms. So that, that sense, like, it didn't really step outside. There is a place in here for, for that. And I, one of the things that um, I did when I was working on Citizen is I asked white women to tell me something they do and they know they do it because they're white. As they're doing it, they're like, I'm doing this because I am a white woman. And so one of my friends said to me, well, the thing that I do, and I know I do it because I'm white, is when I'm in, on the East Coast, because I, I live in California half, half, of, half the time. And she said, you know, when I'm in New York or anywhere that, where there's public transportation, I tend to um, sit in that empty seat next to the black guy. And, and I thought, you know, I do that too. 
And it's one of those moments where you understand there's a, a real thing called ethical loneliness, right? The ethics of our culture is creating inside the bodies of individual people that sense that the external structures of our democracy will shore up any feelings of loneliness that they might have internally through its laws, through its policing, through who gets to sit next to whom. And so you're just going to slide your body in there to say, I don't agree with that. On the train, the woman standing makes you understand there are no seats available. And in fact, there is one. Is the woman getting up at the next stop? Getting off at the next stop? No, she would rather stand all the way to Union Station. The space next to the man is the pause in a conversation you are suddenly rushing to fill. You step quickly over the woman's fear, a fear she shares, you let her have it. The man doesn't acknowledge you as you sit down because the man knows more about the unoccupied seat than you do. For him, you imagine, it is more like breath than wonder. He has had to think about it so much, you wouldn't call it thought. When another passenger leaves his seat and the standing woman sits, you glance over at the man. He's gazing out the window into what looks like darkness. You sit next to the man on the train, bus, in the plane, waiting room, anywhere he could be forsaken. You put your body there in proximity to, adjacent to, alongside. You don't speak unless you're spoken to, and your body speaks to the space you fill, and you keep trying to fill it, except the space belongs to the body of the man next to you, not to you. Where he goes, the space follows him. If the man left his seat before Union Station, you would simply be a person in a seat on the train you would cease to struggle against the unoccupied seat. When, where, why, the space won't lose its meaning. You imagine, if the man spoke to you, he would say, it's okay, I'm okay, you don't need to sit here. You don't need to sit, and you sit and look past him into the darkness. The train is moving through a tunnel. All the while, the darkness allows you to look at him, does he feel you looking at him? You suspect so. What does suspicion mean? What does suspicion do? The soft gray green of your coat touches the sleeve of him. You are shoulder to shoulder, though standing, you could feel shadowed. You sit to repair whom? Who? You erase that thought. And it might be too late for that. It might forever be too late or too early. The train moves too fast for your eyes to adjust to anything beyond the man, the window, the tile tunnel, its slick darkness. Occasionally, a white light flickers by like a displaced sound. From across the aisle, tracks, room, harbor world, a woman asks a man in the rows ahead, if he would mind switching seats. She wishes to sit with her daughter or son. You hear, but you don't hear, you can't see. It's then the man next to you turns to you. And as if from inside your own head, you agree that if anyone asks you to move, you'll tell them we are traveling as a family. So thank you.
the uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. It's, he got it. Between us, between strangers, our civic contract states, we will act in each other's best interest for no other reason than we are here together. Beaver Creek 911, where's your emergency? I'm at the uh, Beaver Creek Walmart. There's a uh, gentleman walking around with a gun in the store. Is he got it pulled out? Yeah, he's like 20 of the people. What do they look like? He's a black male, probably about six foot tall. Okay, what's he wearing? Um, blue shirt, blue pants. Where is he at now? He's over in the pet. Can I have your name, please? My name is Ronald Ritchie. The alliance we pledged is to one another. Assurance is taken. Can I trust you? Assurance is taken different from and similar to each other. Sir, what's going on? Gunshot to the store. Police officers are here, they're on the scene. All right. Whatever the precise thinking behind the question, the question is asked deep within us. We recognize that inevitably I am going to have to put my trust in you. Stop. Listen to me. Okay. Stop. Walk, walk, walk on your own. Walk on your own. Sergeant, you're the walk. Six one three zero for the uh, emergency. Five seven six eight. She's not right there. I'm going up right there. Now any elevator? Yeah, well we got the elevator right now, man. Giving you an opportunity to stand up. You want to stand up? Strickland, just stand up. Will you stand up? Oh, all right, do a what? No complaints, sorry. Okay. Radio 12 out that subject uh, to South Michigan. Walking by and doing what? Well, you're making people nervous. By walking by? Yeah, they said you had your hands in your pockets. Wow, walking by having your hands in your pockets makes people nervous to call the police when it's snowing outside? They did. Okay. So are you okay? I'm fine. How about you? I'm good. All right. Uh, what are you up to today? Walking with my hands in my pockets, walking. Get your license, please. Yeah, go! Get it! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! I just got my license! You think you're my license? I got my license right here! That's my license right there! Put your hands behind your back! 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 Put your hands behind your back. What did I do, sir? Are you hit? I think so. I can't feel my leg. I don't know what happened. I just grabbed my leg. Rachel on A66, I need a 10.52. Why did you, why did you shoot me? We got pulled over for a busted tail light in the back. And the police just, he's, he's, he's covered. He ain't killed my boyfriend. He's licensed, he's carried to, he's licensed to carry. He was trying to get out his ID and his wallet out his um pocket, and he let the officer know that he was re he had a firearm and he was reaching for his wallet, and the officer just shot him in his arm. We're waiting for a back. I will, sir. No worries. I will. He just shot his arm off. We got pulled over on Larpener. I told him not to reach for it. I told him to get his hand out. He had, you told him to get his ID, sir, and his driver's license. Please don't oh tell God, me. Please don't tell me. Please, Jesus, no. Please, 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 no.
It's okay, I'm not here with you. Let him be go, Lord. Please, Lord. Y'all, please pray for us, Jesus, please, y'all. I ask everybody on Facebook, everybody that's watching, everybody that's tuned in, please pray for us. We're circling the understanding that daily we have to take a leap of faith regarding you. In order that we can go on believing in our mobility, trust is what pledging and allegiance secures. Public trust relies on both an implicit understanding and a mode of seeing. Someone is paying attention. Someone is watching. See? If you see something, say something, because we will trust you. Peace of mind gives us the ability to move through our day without fear. It keeps us in our rhythms. It gives us an air of confidence regarding an illusory control of the world around us. We understand what will happen next. And this is crucial to a sense of well-being, even if this control is no control at all. When something occurs that disallows the taking for granted of one's own safety, when something happens, when that thing happens. So what's your business with me right now? I want to find out who you are and, and what the problem was. There is no problem, that's the thing. So talk to me, let me know and let you, you are, know. You Why do I have to let you know who I am to let who I am isn't because the problem? Well, I don't have to let you. People. Well, I know my rights. First off, secondly, okay. secondly, okay. I don't have to let you know who I am if I hadn't broken any laws. I told, like I told him, I'm going to New Horizons to pick up my kids at 10 o'clock. I was sitting there for 10 minutes, <laughs> fully, okay. like not before he walked up to me or anything. He walked up to me a minute after and got irate with me. So first off, that's a public area. And if there's no sign that doesn't say this is a private area, you can't sit here, no one can tell me I can't sit there. If that's the case, then I can't sit here. There is no, the problem is I'm black. That's the problem. We might find discomfort in a loss of comfort. We might lose an ease of movement around another the perceived inability to trust another. No one wishes his or her sense of trust violated. Each time we pass through our public spaces, the question presents as a gentle nudge against an unconscious reliance on public trust. Would you, could you, should you trust? Step out of the car. Can I have the right to do that? I do have the right. Now step out or I will remove you. I refuse to talk to you other than to identify myself. Step out or I will remove you. I am getting removed for a failure. Step out or I will remove you. I'm giving you a lawful order. Get out of the car now or I'm going to remove you. And I'm calling my I'm going to yank you out of here. Okay, you're going to yank me out of my car? Get out. Okay, all right. Let's, let's do this. Yeah, we're going to. Yeah. Don't, don't touch me. Get out of the car. Don't touch me. I'm not under arrest. You don't have the right to take me. You are under car. arrest. I'm under arrest for what? 25 for what? County FM 1098. For what? Get out of the car. Get out of the car now. Why am I being apprehended? You're trying to give me a taste. I said get out of the car. Why am I being apprehended? I'm you're giving you a lawful order. order. You're I'm going to drag car. you out of here. So you're going to get there and drag me out of my car. Get out of the car! And then you I will light you up! Get out! Wow. Now! Wow. Get out of the car! As we daily move through our streets, in our parks, across bridges, in the aisles of stores, anywhere and everywhere we live, 
a simple truth and a basic understanding exists when I walk toward you. It's one of the reasons I'm interested in. As we turn to each other, it's one of the reasons I'm interested in. Each second inside our unspoken question is one of the reasons I'm interested in. Thank you, Claudia. We're going to start with Ariana Stokas. Thank you for that, Claudia. Um, I think it's important to always take a minute. So I'm going to take a minute. So these are footage and conversations that um, presently I'm teaching a class at Bard on the movement for black lives that on a weekly basis my students and I talk about. It's hard to find words on a daily basis to talk about such things, um, to talk about such things in ways that are honest and talk about things in such ways that reveal our vulnerabilities, to center ourselves in institutions that often feel remote, and how we begin to take responsibility for what goes on in our country for many people on a daily basis. So the remarks that I prepared and the question that I have, so racism, as citizens searingly captures, can be banal, mundane, and it can sneak up when one believes that they're in a safe space among people who seem enlightened or who are not going to perpetrate. These banalities, I believe, build up in our society over time. They're a residue that begins to build and stick to institutions and then moves and spills out into the type of systemic violence and racism that we see in our country every day. I think that this kind of well-intentioned, banal racism is often for college students and faculty who I work with who are underrepresented in the academy. It's deeply damaging. There are many people in the academy for whom daily existence is a series of difficult conversations, and for whom instituting policies on things like safe space and trigger warnings may only serve to provide a mechanism for those looking to avoid substantive, anti-racist, anti-classist, and anti-sexist work. I'm not convinced that making policy or instituting policy on things like trigger warnings or safe space will prevent or change 
some of the banal racism that higher education perpetrates. I think as we watch these videos, we see the history of the United States unfold in front of us and think about the policies and the laws that we have and things still keep happening. I think that only collective and concerted effort that truly works to create anti-racist educational environments uh, will in fact lead to this. Without human accountability and trust in the teaching and learning endeavor in our daily experience in education, we'll only continue, without this it will only continue to provide environments where racism sneaks up, destabilizing and delegitimizing in the only way that whiteness in the academy does. So I'm interested to hear your perspective on how in your work with the r racial imaginary um, that you've recently spoken about, how can the racial imaginary move historically white colleges and universities toward greater human responsibility for creating anti-racist, anti-classist, and anti-sexist environments? Uh, Bob Boyers, thank you. I've read and reread Claudia Rankin's Citizen and feel that I haven't quite gotten to the bottom of it, so that I'm very much looking forward to discussing the book in a graduate course at the New School this winter where my students are sure to have compelling things to say, and where the question, why are you teaching this book in a course in cultural criticism when it is, isn't it a book of poetry, is sure to be raised. To which I will say simply that Citizen is a genre-busting book, and that it seemed to me a challenge to think of it as what at least in part it is, which is to say a very original work of cultural criticism. There is a lot of political parable or anecdote in Citizen. Much of it is poignant, loaded with feelings impossible to ignore. Some readers tell us that the tales of everyday life recounted in Citizen expose what is really there. Yet in rereading these tales, I've been troubled by what the author too consistently makes of them. Sometimes I think to myself, an anecdote is just an anecdote. Often, in fact, an anecdote is not even the beginning of an argument or a conversation, but a way of declaring that there is nothing more to talk about. And when you assemble a whole succession of tales and anecdotes, however moving, and we all know how moving many of these passages are in Citizen, and you suggest that they all point more or less in the same direction, you may well do so in order to say that the important questions are settled, that we ought by now to know how to interpret things in the one single correct way you have proposed. Item. A close friend is said to have called Claudia Rankine in a moment of distraction by the name of her black housekeeper. The telling of this incident carries with it the expression of a grievance, focused on a friend who is said perhaps to have thought that all black people look the same, so the author suggests. Of course, I can't tell anyone else not to feel angry in the face of a casual slippage. That is the word used by Claudia Rankine in her account, slippage. But I will say that for me, the key element in that anecdote is to be found in the words addressed by the author to herself you never called her on it. Why not, the author then asks, though she doesn't attempt to answer her own question. And so I think, well, real talk, that is, strenuous conversation with persons apt to disagree with you is perhaps not now, not at this point, the primary instinct for this brilliant and virtuosic composer of poems and stories. Why speculate in this way? Again, 
because the anecdotes in Citizen are selected not for the way they open up difficult questions, but for the way they confirm again and again what is felt to be indisputable. I know too, because it seems at least somewhat pertinent, that the offending figure in the anecdote I've cited is quote, a close friend, so that some of us would think the hurt felt by the author might well be an ideal occasion for real talk and for a deepening of what was already a genuine friendship. Instead, as we read through the account we're given and set it alongside several of the later incidents narrated in the book, we can only think the point is principally to suggest what everyone should know, which is that white people, including the author's friends, are often disappointing fair enough, and that black people have been on the receiving end of insults and aggressions, intentional or unintentional, in a degree we have not adequately understood. Again, fair enough. But we're not here simply to affirm those observations, tempting though it is to do just that, especially if we're moved and shaken by much that is said in Citizen. We're also here to ask whether there is not in certain precincts of the culture an effort to forbid or to inhibit controversy so that our little worlds will seem entirely safe. And so I want to suggest that the strategy exhibited in Citizen seems to me problematic because for all of the book's originality and its terrible beauty, I cannot but see it as a part of the effort to create a society that too much resembles what David Bromwich calls a church held together by the hunt for heresies. That is not a church I would hope to join. When I read Citizen, I cannot but wonder whether for most instances recorded, the author might not have supplied another counter instance, or why in interpreting her own anecdote, she did not, some of the time, consider alternative readings. I want to feel that even what appear to the author to be unimpeachably enlightened conclusions may be still usefully interrogated. Consider that the rhetorically powerful repetition of the words, what did you say? And did I hear what I think I heard? Not only signals a sort of controlled, often justifiable outrage, but also belief that in the world we live in, none of us should have to hear or deal with utterances we dislike. This sense belongs to what Bromwich calls the soft despotism, which holds that any gesture or word or opinion that might cause friction is unhelpful, so that we must not only watch what we say, but create a culture where all feel they have a sacred right not to feel offended. Of course, this is an understandable, all too human desire. But then the effort to close the book on potentially loaded disputes can also encourage the kind of self-censorship that makes discussion bland and completely dishonest. Nothing bland in the many conferences I have assembled on race and identity issues over the last 51 years where black thinkers from Daryl Pinckney Emily Bernard, Orlando Patterson, and Anthony Appiah have vigorously disagreed, disagreed about highly sensitive matters we're nowadays told to believe are off the table. There are all sorts of important things we'll never talk about if we're perpetually reaching for some version of, did I hear that? Or is this an okay conversation to be having? Yes. I say, as I read Citizen, this is an okay conversation to be having this one, which you think ought not to be okay. Of course, I too would rather not engage yet again in certain battles I have been fighting all my life. And so I believe, I could be wrong, that I understand why Claudia Rankine would rather not have to revisit or argue about many of the urgent and painful realities that have sometimes enraged her. And yet, I worry, as I have said, that perhaps she has arrived at the conclusion that when it comes to sensitive issues, especially regarding race matters, I too should not and even must not be having 
or fostering discussion, whether I want to or not, should not, must not. Though as a devoted reader of her work, I've taught her poetry in poetry classes, and I'm about to teach citizen in my cultural criticism class, I cannot but suppose that Claudia Rankine has long been as invested in real conversation as I have been. Conversation, an activity that keeps alive the possibility of doubt and unease, an activity whose objective is not a truth or a position or an approved attitude, but a commitment to keep on listening and talking. Thank you. Um, Carolyn Lazard, thanks. Thank you, Roger. Um, thank you, Claudia. I guess I want to use my time to um, maybe address specifically microaggressions, um, which I think is are generally discussed as something that's kind of endemic around white institutions, but that maybe we need to think of as having connections to um, just thinking a little bit more about um, their relationship to macro macroaggressions. Um, I think this is echoed in Citizen, um, but I've had lots of conversations with friends around how um, racism is not just structural oppression, but that it is structural oppression plus gaslighting. That it's not just you know, the dehumanization of black people on the level of the institution, but it's, that the, it's also the pervasive and sort of consistent denial of that experience. It's that it didn't happen, or it wasn't that bad, or that it's not still happening. Um, it's about a sort of consistent erasure of the past. Um, I think this tends to suggest that Black people and white people, and I'm, you know, I'm thinking about comments that were made yesterday during this conference about maybe expanding the scope of what we're talking about, but for the sake of this time, I want to talk about black people and white people. Um, that black people and white people have a very different um, temporal relationship to history. That the racial violence of the past is not history that we are in an active and continu a continuous period of racial violence. Um, I think what happens is often that the way white people relate to the history of racial violence in this country is that this is a thing that happened. Um, and for black people, that this thing that is not a thing that happened, it is not discontinuous with the present, it is happening. Um, and as Claudia mentioned about uh, the film, Ava DuVernay's film, The 13th, um, and how that film draws connections between the history of slavery um, and its continuation in th through the persecution of black people through the concept of criminality in mass incarceration. Um, I don't think microaggressions are necessarily about being offended. Um, so much as maybe about how they facilitate a certain kind of a state of psychological collapse. Um, what I guess I'm curious about is how can we start having conversations around care and about how we can address ourselves to the physical and uh, mental health of black people. That discourses of care are critical and in some ways might make up for the lack um, that we sometimes find in, dis in a discourse of rights when it comes to race relations. Um, I also think in terms of thinking about microaggressions as um, something that needs to be addressed on the psychological level, that they often articulate a kind of afterlife of trauma, that the mind and the body are haunted. Um, one attempts to live in the present, but um, you know, a, a single comment or a, or a gesture will remind you of you know, centuries of history that designate you as less than. Um, we are brought back to the site of trauma despite, despite our efforts. Um, I think the way this often gets interpreted is, is, is that our needs are excessive, that our, 
our need for redress is excessive and that um, you know, the response is often, you've had enough, you've assimilated, what more do you want? Um, I'd hope that maybe this excessiveness could be met with a surplus of care and that we might be able to use these kinds of opportunities to really rethink the scarce, this, the kind of model of scarcity around addressing racism, that we've already addressed it and that we might have, I guess what I'm trying to say is, have we actually reached the limit? Like, is there more to be done? And I think that we often operate around this model of scarcity, which is echoed you know, in lots of different ways, thinking about, um, even thinking about like economic scarcity as was discussed in our previous panel about the kind of collusion of race and class. And then I guess my last point that I wanna make is that, um, and that I think is very much echoed in Claudia's work, is that white supremacy is an active process. It's an ongoing performance. performance. Um, we miss this when we suggest that institutions are irreparably flawed instead of seeing the space of exclusion as one that's actively maintained. Um, we tend to think of racism as a disembodied system, something that is mapped onto all of us. Um, we believe that racism is an institution, but we do not address how it is kept alive, how it feeds on the blood of American citizens, how it breathes through us. We keep it alive by naturalizing its effects on our world, the ways in which Maybe an institution like Bard is primarily white. Maybe you came from a primarily white neighborhood, a primarily white school. And if you continue to move through those spaces as if those spaces are somehow natural, that is very much a part of the way in which we continue to maintain white supremacy. I'll end on that note, thank you. Um, I, I will start my response for, by thanking all three of you for spending time with Citizen and engaging its questions and um, uh, let's see. So Ernie, the first question was how is your work the racial imaginary creating, um, and how does it endeavor to create anti-racist, anti-sexist environments? Um, I, I think that the imagination um, is, is a side of, of a lot of our problems because we have seen that the civil rights period was able to institute actual legislative change, right? Um, you can enter spaces you couldn't enter before, you could sit on the counter with people, you couldn't, you can now sit next to a white person if you choose to, you can sit in the back of the bus, you can sit in the front of the bus, you can do all of these things, you can vote. Um, so legislation was changed and yet, um, at every turn, people of color were being stopped and murdered. And um, so I think, it, I think after a while you have to think, why don't we think about the imagination? Why don't we think we're cultural beings? The, um, the imagination was formed, a lot of energy was put into creating a white supremacist orientation in universities like this one. Eugenics is, you know, is a real thing. It was studied, the, the erroneous information was put out in books by academics from esteemed colleges to support the slave trade and, and the um, hierarchical system that was put in place. Um, we had, um, you know, I won't keep going, but I think, so I'm really interested now in what can we do to shift the imagination and who's being left out because of the insistence 
on um, white dominance. If you go, you know, in my class, we did this thing where we, we went into the computer and we did searches, random searches. So we searched um, in Google, boyhood. Every image that arrived was a white boy. Every single one. If you, you can do it for yourself. Just put boy, boy, or put, just put boys in there in Google and then see what happens in the image page. So why are these things perpetuating? And why, why are um, people of color not inside these moments? So I, I'm, I'm really interested in complicating what we see. There's a great ad today in the New York Times about um, procedures when you travel. And the image of the person shaking the hand and did anyone else see this? And, um, and kissing the cheek is a black male. And he, it's being performed, all of these different um, procedures are being performed by two black men as these cosmopolitans who would be traveling the world. It was the first time I've ever seen anything like that. It was pretty exciting for me, I don't know. You could see that, I don't, I don't get out much. Um, so, but that's, that's, an, that's an, uh, a moment of changing the imagination, be beginning to get inside the mythology around white excellence, white beauty, white, um, white consumerism. Um, the control of white spaces by the imagination whether or not their diverse spaces continues. Um, you know, like the white classroom, you go into the classroom, the room might look diverse, but the syllabus isn't. That's another way of controlling um, the way in which the imagination continues to privilege whiteness. Um, and Roger, you were talking about um, Citizen is a book that doesn't sponsor conversation, doesn't that is, to quote you, a church, what is that quote? Held together by the hunt for heresy. Um, interesting. I, I, I mean, I, to me, Citizen is a book of questions. The, structurally, it's a book that was put together to create as much openness for the reader as possible. The use, the pronominal sight of the you as a place that you have to crawl into and decide whether or not you have any relation to the anecdotal moment was a very conscious one. The use of the first person I think would have been that church. It would have said, I had this and you were wrong for doing this to me. Instead it said, you do this, you do this. Maybe you, if you climb into the space, if you own this as something you recognize, then recognize it. If you don't, then move on. It, it's, um, there are moments in Citizen, like the one um, Roger brought up with the friend who, it says, um, why have you never spoken about this? And then, you say it doesn't try and answer the question, but in fact it says, is it this? Or are you not speaking about it because you yourself are invested in a class distinction among blacks and you don't like being compared to a, a maid? Is that your problem? Is that what's silencing you? Or is it this other thing? Is it, another, is it another dynamic inside a structure that forces you to think about yourself as black relative to other black people in this way, relative to this white woman in this way who is a friend? What is going on? So that is what that sentence construction was meant to enact. Not a church of it must be this, it was meant to sort of perform the constant ways in which when 
we receive, you know, Judith Butler talks about adjustability, the fact that we arrive in front of the other and our positioning in relation means we're open to whatever they say. And then when it comes at us, we're constantly negotiating the meaning of that and how we're positioned relative to that and thinking about what we bring to our capacity to interpret that, right? So there are moments in the, in the um, book, there's one, many of these anecdotes were collected, they're not necessarily my own, but one of them is, and it's the one where um, I invite my neighbors over for dinner because a friend, a black friend of mine has moved to town. And, um, and I know that given what I know historically, it is possible that if he enters our house and we're not home, they will call the police because the white imagination views black malehood as criminal. We just know that. And we know it because we have a lot of evidence of it enacting itself every day. And so I invite my friends, my neighbors, who I consider my friends, over and I say, hey, you know, Harry just moved to town. He's a good friend of ours. He might be in and out of our house. We have wine, we have cheese. You know, it's all, all great. And then he leaves, and then a couple months pass. He comes by to babysit for us while we, my husband and I go see a movie, and they call the police. And four police cars arrive. Eight police are standing there with guns on their holsters, asking him, who are you? What are you doing here? And that's because I live in a neighborhood where I'm the only black person with my daughter. Um, so in that situation, my husband and I, we're in the car. We're, I don't know if you guys have ever lived in L.A., but we're trapped in that car. And, <laughs> and so by the time we get home, I am so anxious that maybe something could have happened. And um, luckily, we, you know, our neighbor, find, we convinced him on the phone to go out there and tell them that he, not only do we know him, he's our friend, and we gave him the keys, and our daughter is in the house. And um, so he finally did it. And when I got home, I said to my, my um, friend, I said to him, the next time you want to talk on the phone, just go in the backyard. That was a failure on my part. But what the book is interested in, Roger, is not answering or preaching or telling anybody what to do or not to do. It's interested in uncovering how these dynamics are in play and how one then ends up saying something, like I said to that black man, just go in the backyard so that these people won't call the police and perhaps kill you. And you find, you know, and then I'm responsible for the fact that you're dead just because we wanted to go see a film. And luckily he said to me, um, I can talk on the phone wherever I like. But that, you know, so those are just moments for me within, within the book that are, are interactions in relation that the reader can enter and decide, do I recognize this moment or do I not? Is this like an incident that has only happened once and she is pulling it out of proportion? Or is it something that is a cultural recognition, a cultural failure that I, I have been part of again and again and again? Um, the second section of Citizen is a, um, an essay on Serena Williams. And one of the reasons I put it in was in answer to Roger's positioning that he is being preached at. Um, I wanted a situation where the dynamics of a life were researchable, that you could go in there and look up those matches and understand that I'm not just giving you my perspective, that you can also look at them and decide 
decide what's happening in that 2004 match, what's happening in that 2011 match. Why does John McEnroe say, I can't believe this shit is happening to her? What, you know, what's, what are the dynamics that are creating that in his own utterance? So that's why that second section exists. The rest of the book for me is about taking your foot off your throat, allowing yourself to speak, to have the conversation that the culture has shut down, that, um, I mean, we're seeing it in, in a way with Bar, um, Donald Trump's people. What is it, um, the basket of deplorables, if we use um, Hillary Clinton's terminology. But that sense that political correct correctness has silenced us. So the book was meant to do exactly the opposite, that we need to start talking about these things. Don't feel like, even though somebody is making you uncomfortable by bringing something up, that you can't bring it up because it will then make them uncomfortable. If I were to say, oh, that's racist, that would make them uncomfortable, and I wasn't brought up that way. And so that sense of why, why do you not say something in those situations is exactly the question. What in the culture has stopped you from being able to respond immediately? Like we, you know, when somebody says, I grab women by their pussies, we know now we're supposed to say, misogyny, sexist, don't say that. But it took women a whole revolution to get to that, right? And for people of color, the ability to actually advocate for themselves as individuals in these relational moments with people who might have employed them, might be, you know, or, or, or in friendships that they value, that's something to be learned. It's to be learned. Which is an ironic, but one has to learn to actually not, un, you know, not just hold the discomfort in one's body and not say, no, this is yours. Um, and the last, um, let's see. Well, I think we more agree than not in terms of our positioning. Um, this, this idea of discourse of rights is something that I'm really interested in, in connection to what you said. Um, and how the afterlife of trauma stays in the body. There's a, there's a new book out um, by a good friend of mine, Sarah Shulman, called Conflict is Not the Enemy. And that we have gotten to a point where we don't talk. As a culture, we, you know, I don't, I don't want to be like your therapist, but um, we as a culture have to realize that talking about things can be uncomfortable. And to be in a moment of conflict with the other is okay. That's okay. If it means that the conversation happens. This not talking about things that are affecting our lives is in part what has gotten us this far in the whole in terms of um, assumptions around what and who we are. So those are, those are my answers. Thank you again. So um, we're a little over time, but I'm going to make some time for questions. Um, and uh, I don't know how easy it is for the mics to get around with people on the uh, floor. If to the extent people on the floor can move into the seats, that will make it easier. But um, let me see. It's actually having trouble seeing in the audience right now. There's one way in the back. I can't really see. Yeah, your hand. Can someone give him a mic? Um, it's on. Okay. Just want to say, first of all, thank you for all of this. Um, my question is trying to relate 
what we've just experienced to the first panel in a way. Um, I think a lot of what we heard in the first panel was sort of trying to wrestle with this idea of like the individual versus rigid classifications around race and class. And I think um, there's like sort of this American idealization of the individual. Um, and we're calling for in some way a way of seeing people not as instantiations of a race or a class or a gender and so on. And we had this conversation about intersectionality sort of almost being counterproductive in its sort of minutia and trying to find all these different ways of, of cutting, people, <coughs> cutting people up in these ways. Um, and so I guess my question is like how, how do we reconcile these, these things? On the one hand we have this deeply entrenched cultural rhetoric around the individual and, and being seen as an individual and the valorization thereof. On the other hand we have an equally if not deeper entrenchment of institutional practices which at le like with terms of non-whiteness you know, being a reification, something that we absolutely are forced to see as a category. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess my question is, do we, ha like, do you on the panel see us as needing to abandon the rhetoric of the individual, dr re dramatically revise this rhetoric, or, or reconsider what we mean by the individual in light of these institutional practices, or to put it in a different way, if the idealized individual is implicitly white, how do non-whites relate to this American cultural identity? Thank you. Um, does anyone want to try that? Or should we go take another question? Well, um, the, this, 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 it's on? Okay, it's good. Um, well, the, this idea of personhood I mean, I, I think from an idealized point of view, that's what we want, right? And, and that, I think, is what Gurn was talking about, that from an idealized point of view, we want individuals to be individuals, to be able to stand, but, but we are working from a deficit where whiteness has held the place of, um, of the universal transcendent individual and everybody else is hyphenated. And it seems like we're hyphenating by ethnicity, but we're actually hyphenating by who gets to be, who's approaching personhood but has not arrived there yet inside the imagination of the universalized imagination of whiteness. And, and what we're ultimately talking about is who has the power. You know, it, it wouldn't matter that you thought me an animal and, you know, you were saying, look at that monkey run as, you know, has been said about black athletes or whatever. If it also was not being um, reinforced by the institutions that you run. I mean, white men, 90% of elected offices in the United States are held by whites. 75% of those are held by white men who are 35% of the population. That is not inc incidental or unimpactful to my state of mobility inside this culture. So yes, to your question, yes we want personhood to exist, but, but we can't get there until a lot of other things get addressed. I, I would just say that um, it seems to me um, the notion of speaking of individuals as individuals is not um, an idealization, um, it's simply the acknowledgement of uh, a fact um, that each, uh, each person um, has many identities um, and can't be reduced um, to any one of them. Um, that it's impossible to speak of, of human beings um, in that way, as if they were reducible to one thing only, such as their uh, class or gender uh, or affiliation or skin color. Um, and in that sense, I don't think really uh, to speak in that way, the rhetoric of, of the individual seems to me not at all an idealization. It's just an acknowledgement of a simple fact. 
Um, each one of us, um, if asked, um, will acknowledge uh, a multiplicity of identities. All right, I, 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 will, I will acknowledge the fact that I'm, I'm male, that I'm a father, um, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm a husband, that I'm a professor, that I've written many books, um, and that I've done all sorts of things that no one else in this room has done. Uh, there's nothing particularly unusual about that. It's peculiar, right? And just like everybody else. Um, the problem for me, as I think about this issue, um, has to do with uh, the language itself has come to authorize certain ways of talking about this and certain ways of talking about who we are and what we are, um, which most of us are unwilling at this point to call out. I'm going to be very specific about this. When I hear the term, the white imagination, I, I have to pinch myself. And I have to think, the white imagination, you mean the imagination of Mary Gateskill? Or the imagination of Donald Trump? When I think of the white imagination, am I thinking of Katha Pollitt uh, or Nadine Gordimer? I mean, which white imagination is involved in that the expression? One, the one that um, allows all those people to believe she's shot on the street. When I walk into a space, and my personhood is devalued immediately based on my skin color. That is because the white imagination as a cultural entity has reduced me to nothing. That's the white imagination I'm talking about. I, I, I find that entirely persuasive um, in, in the instance that you cite, and yet I, I do um, suggest that the term itself, right, when employed casually in the way that it is often employed in the contemporary academy um, is a extremely misleading and mischievous term. As you employed it, right, it's precise and meaningful, but I don't think that's how it's often employed. Yeah, I, just to weigh in, I. I don't feel it's the white, the idea of the white imagination is for many people ever employed capriciously. I think it carries a historical weight that's very important to consider in how cultural production has served to circumscribe the personhood of people of color so that the right to be seen as an individual is already circumscribed by certain visions of who is to be epistemically valued. So the way in which we look at an individual already, for people of color often, you don't actually often have a right to be seen as an individual. Your individuality is blanketed um, because of the kinds of cultural images and imaginaries that surround who people believe you to be. Um, so that the right or to become any one of the categories that you identified um, is, is often not the way in which individuality functions under certain categories of, of people. I think maybe, maybe to take a risk and talk about something a little just slightly adjacent, um, there's, there's the way in which um, black people are part of a mass because of the white imagination. I think it might be useful just addressing your question directly. Um, I do a lot of work thinking about, thinking through and studying disability, um, which in some ways is an identity marker that um, is actually a, a, a challenge to the idea of an aut autonomous individual, not necessarily because of the white imagination, but actually because um, disabled people are necessarily reliant on others and uh, dependent on others, and that ruptures the idea or even the capacity to think of the self as being an individual. Um, and so I think from that perspective, I would say I'm ready to not necessarily revisit, but maybe let's, you know, abandon it and um, try to think of something else that actually reflects the ways in which we all um, relate to each other. 
Is there a... Uh, yeah, in the middle there. The, yes. Yeah, with the hat on. Um, I haven't really... I've only read the first two chapters of your book. I'm not a freshman, right? But from what you said before, earlier what you said, you said right now you don't want to be like a so-called therapist for the entire society, right? But I feel like in this state of like of unknown that we're in as a society, I feel like the number one thing we do need is a therapist because we're not like, <laughs> I feel like if we approach it from the standpoint on the outside looking in, if we ask ourselves the questions, if somebody else asks us as a society the questions that we don't want to ask ourselves as to, okay, why do people do this a certain way? Or how come, like what you said with the example in your book, or what, what you said earlier when you were standing about how this lady didn't want to sit next to a black man. If somebody from the outside looking in, like analyze that in the most like, I don't know, psychological, you know, in depth way they can, I feel like some of the core problems with our society will be answered, right? Like your thing with microaggressions, I feel like the, what makes an aggression itself is the fact that we understand there's a result that comes from that. We understand that by doing a certain thing, there's a reaction that we're expecting. And if we don't get that reaction that we're expecting, we're forced to react in another way to try to produce what we're initially looking for. So my question to you is, what exactly are we afraid of? Or like as a culture, right? So what, are, what do you think we're afraid of? I know there will be a lot of different answers, right? But just from what you said and from what I, the first two chapters that I've read, I feel like there's a certain element of fear that comes with different cultures and how we interact with each other. Even in the video, you show how there was a, you said earlier, there's an element of fear that keeps us in a way, I don't know how you stated it, but you said there's an element of fear that makes us act the way we do. And I think that goes in both ways. I know why I act differently when I see a cop now, right? But I understand now, like, I don't understand, like, what element of fear, in terms of ideals, not necessarily the physical me approaching a cop or a cop approaching me, but the idealist type of fear that a cop has when he sees a black person, right? So I want to know, from coming from you, what do you think that actual element of fear entails? That's a good question. Uh, you know, um, the one of the things that has fascinated me lately. I've been looking at the transcripts of police shooting, um, especially when it's a white policeman who shoots um, a person of color. And there are moments when you say, why did, you know, somebody says, why did you, sh why did you shoot? And they say, I don't know. I don't know. Exactly. And Darren Wilson, why did you kill Michael Brown? Because when I saw him, what I saw was a demon. What I saw was, what, what was the other thing he said? The Hulk. The Hulk. So that, that, that's the imagination I'm talking about. It, and it didn't happen accidentally. There has been an investment in criminalizing the bodies of black people from the get-go. And that has stayed current and is something that can be utilized when, when um, it needs to be. I, I agree with you. I think there's a critic, Lauren Ballant, who I'm, I'm very fond of as a person, but also in terms of her work. She um, has a book of, um, entitled Cruel Optimism. And in that book she talks, she wonders why individuals, people, cultures attach them things themselves to things that are toxic. That's why it's cruel optimism. You, you, it's cruel because it's toxic, it doesn't really help you. And yet the attachment is part of your sense of who you are in the world and you cannot let it go. And so racism somehow has been a part of what it means to be American. Uh, for white Americans, and, and, and now for people of color. I mean, these dynamics are also at play inside black families, as we know. If you have a light-skinned child, that child gets preferential treatment subtly. 
So it's, it's you know, there's, there's also Fans Fano, psychiatrist, Algerian, who you might be interested in his work, Black Skin, White Mask, in which he looks at the psychic um, ways in which racism uh, gets built inside the black consciousness so that the white person doesn't need to be in the room anymore. They'll do the work of self-hating for themselves. So it's, you know, it goes through the culture in such, such um, profound ways and ultimately impacts the body in ways that are detrimental. So I think, you know, I have no answer really just to say that you're right. It is, it's, it's, a, it's a cancer in the society it's, and it's psychically damaging not just for people of color but also for white people. Because the illusion is that all of this belongs to people of color and that white people are not damaged by it. But when white people begin to understand that they too are being damaged by it, that they're, being, they're actually killing people and not knowing why they're doing it. I shot an unarmed man, but I don't know why I did it. The fear felt so great in me. I do not disbelieve them when they say, I was so fearful, even though he was unarmed, walking away from me, and I shot him in the back. I felt so fearful, I was moved to kill him. I wouldn't want to be carrying that. So where is that coming from? So yeah, we need a psychiatrist. Can I ask one, one more quick follow-up? Um, I feel like, with, like what you said, that fear factor, right, is like the, the way I look, if I see a white person in a suit or a white male in a suit, I see sort of like an opportunity, right, that I have an opportunity to be what he is, a rich white male, upper class, stuff like that. But then if that same white man looks at another black person, right, he doesn't see opportunity. He sees something like that's his worst nightmare. That's his downfall. That's the worst possible state he can be in if he sees a black person. So do you think that that fear of being like you can look a person in his eyes, you know that could be you, but for coming from a white person, right, or a white male, do you think that fear itself generates that, you know, like the courage to actually shoot somebody, knowing that that could have been you if you if that was like, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know if we could ever get to a place where, where a white person sees a black person and understands exactly what it means to walk in their shoes. I don't know. I don't, because the entire culture of whiteness has privileged whiteness and, and has grown it up inside notions of superiority and success, whether or not it actually exists for that individual person. You know, that's the, that's the, um, so could, could the positioning shift? I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know because it's, it, we're talking about things that are integral to the structuring of the culture to the point that you look at a white man and think, I want to be you. I want access to what you have access to. That's how the equation is now formulated in your head and in the head of many, you know, young black people. And, and, and then white, white people look at black people, black men, and they're like, oh, I'm sure you're a good athlete. I'm sure, do you play an instrument? You know, President, um, President Obama talked about um, being a senator and being at a party and having somebody hand him their drinks. So clearly, he was being viewed as the wait staff. And, and that's what I mean about the white imagination. You're, you know, it's, it's out there. These people are doing these things mindlessly. My, I, I was at Columbia University in the Institute for Social Justice. We showed a film about men in prison. They were black men. And um, 
the woman, a white woman who heads, she is the head of the Institute for Social Justice, the head, the executive director of the Institute for Social Justice. She came up to me and she said, that was a great film. Now, which one of the guys had the mother that sounded white? Which one of the guys had the mother that sounded white? The head of the Institute for Social Justice last year. And I said to her, that's racist. And she said, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? We're sort of technically out of time, um, but let me add, there's one question right down the young lady. Hello. Um, so I grew up in New York City, and I have a lot of friends on social media and in real life who are very uh, active in the Black Lives Matter movement in the city. and. Um, I've seen a lot of people sharing a lot of the images that were actually in the video that you showed in the, the videos. And um, obviously they're very upsetting, so I've seen a lot of people uh, uh, express that they did not want to see that, but I've also seen people express that they thought that sharing those kinds of extremely violent videos um, only furthered a sort of dehumanization of the black people who were, who were being attacked by the police officers. And I heard this idea from my white friends and my friends who are people of color. And um, I was wondering in what way, after having seen the video and also heard your story about um, removing the, the bodies from the lynch mob photo, uh, in what way you think it's beneficial to show this kind of extremely shocking material and what way you think um, it does sort of a bit. Well, uh, you know, every, I have to admit, everywhere I go I get this question because um, we're inside a culture where um, people do not want to be triggered, do not want to be upset by, by upsetting images. I recognize that and that's why it says be advised. When the, the, so there is a warning, a trigger warning at the beginning of the, the video. Part of my personal feeling is that part of the problem with American culture is American amnesia. And for years I have said to people, this stuff is happening, and they say to me, Claudia, you don't know, you weren't there, you didn't see it. I'm sure it's, it's more complicated than you think. And now we have proof. And if proof is what it takes to have some ground level of agreement from which we can have a conversation, then I'm going to drag the proof with me. Because before now, we've been spending a lot of time talking about whether or not my perception is the right perception. Whether or not I'm overly invested in positioning myself as aggrieved when there are extenuation circumstances. Did he or did he not shoot him in the back? Yes, he did. Did they or did they not drag a dead man and yell at him, get up, get up, even after he was dead? Yes, they did. Did they shoot a boy playing with a toy gun without even asking, what are you doing? Yes, they did. So I, yeah, I, I feel like I will not be believed if I don't show it. We will start having semantic games about perception, investment, subjectivity, blah, blah, blah. So let's start at a different place.
And there's a car waiting for me. I'm sorry. So I have to go. Th thank, <laughs> thank you very you. much to Claudia Rankin.